made in math. Does that sound? I thought that was good morning in Irish. <laughs> but please bear with me. That's my accent. And you will have to bear with my English accent as well as the Mediterranean. Uh, today I'm discovering that I'm Irish. I have studied in many countries. I studied in Tunisia. I was born in Tunisia. I studied in Russia, in France, in Canada. I got a diploma from Russia, from France. I worked in Italy, in France, in Tunisia. And I'm, uh, I have done a PhD on uh, recognition of prior learning, recognition of learning, as you just mentioned, referring to several of the uh, researchers and, and uh, uh, the scholar that you just mentioned, Professor, and I am very pleased with that. It reminded me uh, 14 years ago when I finished my PhD. But that's very, I think it's very important, uh, uh, all these points. And uh, in preparing uh, this uh, panel, and, and I hope we'll have uh, our panelists will be joining us in, in a few, few minutes, I, uh, I wanted to refer to uh, some of uh, other scholars that could be of interest and to UNESCO's work as well. And uh, one of the scholars that uh, uh, Professor Ted uh, Fleming referred to, but maybe uh, not uh, uh, to all of them, uh, I, I would like to recall Ivan Illich with his work on de schooling society. And it was, of course, polemic, but it was very interesting to say that uh, in his thinking, he calls for the use of uh, uh, learning webs, which incorporate peer matching networks where description of a person, activities, and skills are mutually exchanged for the education that they would benefit from. What is interesting, I think, uh, is that what Elish is saying is that a good education system should have the three purposes. It should provide all who want to learn with access to available resources at any time in their lives. It should empower all who want to share what they know to find those who want to learn it from them. And finally, furnish all who want to present an issue to the public with the opportunity to make their challenge known. That's about the freedom of, of speech, if I can, I can put it in, in the new words. Based on uh, Ivan Illich's work, on Paul Freire's work, uh, UNESCO has produced several reports. And just to recall, the Fourth report in 1972, the Delors report in 1996, and the last one is the, uh, the Reimagining um, Education, the Futures of Education report, which uh, in a way restate the importance of uh, education as a, uh, a human right, as a right that uh, has to be fulfilled by uh, societies, by the policy makers, but also by uh, the international community. And I think one of the points that uh, is important to highlight in this context is that uh, while we, we consider the interaction between uh, the interpersonal interaction as an important aspect, the individual versus uh, the community, I think what is very important, what we have learned yesterday as well, is that in many indigenous communities, it's not only about individuals' community, but also the planet. It's our interaction with the biodiversity. And it's very interesting that 80% of the word biodiversity is in the places where the indigenous culture is prominent. And that, I think it takes us to a new ground, is that the recognition is a, a democratic process, that is a, is, a, is a process for sustainable development that can protect not only individuals, not only the human being, but also our planet, our biodiversity, others. And those others are not only human, but they are also mo much more diverse. So in uh, our work, in the work of uh, uh, UNESCO in the futures of education, and we put it in plural to consider different scenarios. And I think that's what, what the agency of our human being can contribute is how we can collectively contribute to a, a new future is very important. But we didn't, uh, uh, and we have taken that from a paradigm, and, and uh, I'm moving to the piece that the professor mentioned. I'm taking it to the policy. So we have adopted what we call Mar Marrakesh Framework for Action that uh, states the importance of uh, the recognition as a human right. And um, if you recall, uh, and maybe uh, some of you know, that we have adopted the Right to Education Convention 1960. That's many years ago. And at that time, uh, half of the children were not going to schools. Half of the children of the world were not going to schools. Today, of course, we still have some challenges. And, uh, 
uh, with the, what Professor Ted was mentioning, uh, in my work I cover from early child education to adult learning, so the attention and our knowledge of how the brain get uh, framed and, and the importance of early learning, the importance of the first 1,000 days is, is critical in, def in deciding and defining the, the further learning and, and our lifelong learning path. But what's important in the Marrakesh is that uh, is the call to all the countries politically to adopt the recognition as a, a right, as a human right, and as a right for lifelong learning. And uh, in the work of uh, uh, my team, we are taking uh, this forward in, in an initiative that we are calling Evolving Right to Education to take into account this importance of from early learning to adult learning. Because if we are not investing in early learning, it's very hard to uh, see how we can address adult learning in, 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 in an emancipatory approach as we, we just uh, discussed it. So this evolving right to education is to consider that the human rights and the right to education has to evolve, take into consideration the challenges, the issues, and the problems that we are facing internationally. But uh, the last piece that uh, responds also to the, to the discussion today and tomorrow is the mobility, and uh, we, we just heard about the, in the importance of the mobility. And um, in uh, the conventions for recognition of higher education and qualifications, be it uh, the regional ones like Lisbon, like uh, uh, Addis, uh, Tokyo Convention, Buenos Aires Convention, and the Global Convention, we have uh, introduced three main uh, aspects that were not there uh, in, in, in the past. First is that the state parties would recognize validation of prior learning, meaning if a, a, a country has ratified the convention, they will recognize, it will recognize the validation of prior learning uh, adopted in, in other state parties. And that's a, a first opening that uh, was not in the previous uh, instrument. The second is the recognition of uh, refugees' uh, qualifications, including prior learning uh, of refugees. And that's a second part of engagement of countries toward uh, the recognition of qualifications and toward recognizing qualification in the mobility. As uh, just mentioned, we have six million um, students that are, work, uh, that are studying abroad, but we are expecting this to double in the coming uh, five years by 2030. So the, the question is how we are able to recognize not only people who are moving for Erasmus, but also people who are moving because they are, they are uh, uh, in a way moving from uh, South, South Sudan or from, from Iraq or from other countries. And uh, related to that, we also have uh, developed the UNESCO qualification passport, which is another instrument that helps countries to recognize the qualifications of uh, people, displaced persons, in uh, the context of um, higher education. So these are uh, some of the uh, initiatives that we are having. And uh, I wanted to finish with the uh, last initiative that was mentioned uh, also very briefly, is the, the learning cities. And my colleague Raul is, is in the room here. Is this importance of not considering not only the policy dimension, not only the national or uh, the, the system, but also looking at the city as a place where lifelong learning can be enacted, where the recognition can happen, and uh, taking this learning uh, or contextualized aspect of uh, uh, the, the learning and recognizing all forms of learning is, is something that seems to me uh, an important is part of the work uh, that we are doing. So. Th these are some of the initiatives that we are taking. Uh, I think the, uh, the main point I wanted to mention is uh, while we have been focusing on policy and practices, I think, uh, Professor, you brought the, the other three Ps, and for me they are paradigm, uh, and they define also how we will look at the recognition in this, in this broader context. But obviously we will need to contextualize this, and we would like to see how uh, different contexts how different colleagues who are working in different um, areas are uh, looking at uh, the recognition, how they contextualize it, how they look at its efficiency, how they look at how we can monitor it uh, as well. And those are some of the questions that we will take now in our panel. And I would like to uh, invite to uh, the, uh, the floor here uh, my colleagues um, who are, uh, will be joining us, Pauline uh, Buivin. Uh, uh, she's project and policy manager at the Lifelong Learning Platform, the European Civil Society for Education. Please, Pauline. I would like also to invite uh, Professor Dae Jung Kang, 
Seoul National University, South Korea. I would like also to invite my colleague and, and, and friend, Professor Julie Reddy uh, from uh, South Africa, please. And last but not least, uh, my colleague Diego uh, Piazza Almudi, Director of Management and Consultancy Conocer in Mexico. Thank Welcome. So the first, I hope it can work, it works. So the first question uh, is about uh, contextualization and I would like to ask uh, the four panelists to tell us a bit how recognition in their experience and context has been foundation stone for what, you, what they characterize as democracy. And we'd like to start with Julie, if you don't mind, giving the context also in which you have been uh, evolving. Wh why uh, and, and how uh, recognition is uh, defining the, the democracy in the context of South Africa and maybe in Africa as well, please. Thank you, Maureen, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Ted, you've been singing my song. I can't sing like the Irish. I'm, I don't have a voice, but it's been wonderful. The focus on recognition rather than learning and how we broaden that scope is so important. And, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to represent the global south here and Africa in particular, because we have a particular history, as Boreen has said, that influences, the context that we work in influences our thinking and our journey as lifelong learners. So in South Africa, given our history, um, RPL was a key component that was embodied in our democratic constitution post-1994. And the principles of access, redress, and opportunity creation are embedded in our South African constitution. The first transformative piece of legislation that our country enacted after democracy, so we're a young democracy and we have elections coming up, which would be very interesting, um, is in 1995, so we got our freedom in 1994, in 1995, the first act of the new democratic Nelson Mandela government was to establish the South African Qualifications Authority to design a national qualifications framework that would transform our fractured education and training system into one integrated system. It was a key piece of legislation, but embedded was that, in that was a key principle to develop policy in a suite of policies for educational transformation. And in 2012, the national policy for RPL was enacted. And most of this was motivated by our union movement because our workers had never had their learning and their attributes and their competencies recognized. So we go way back. And you know, our policies are not cast in stone. They've evolved. We revised the policy in 2014. We revised it again based on practice in 20, 2020, I think. And now our policy speaks to RPL for access and RPL for credit. Now the big stumbling block is our higher education system. They refuse to award credits for RPL. They don't mind giving RPL for access and advanced standing. So there are blockages in the system which raises the question for me, are our policies to bring people in or to keep people out? Mm. My conclusion is mostly, and in most countries, it's to keep people out. Boreen, I just want to make a last comment. Um, while I was traveling to Ireland, I was in a lounge and reading a magazine, and the, uh, one of these designers of fancy handbags said, you know, he's been using rural artists in Romania to do his work. And he said he defines responsibility as the ability to respond. And I just want to leave this message that we who are power brokers in this room, we can curate our responses to respond 
in terms of how we recognize, how we reevaluate uh, recognition practices and assessments so that we can bring people into the system so they can exercise their agency rather than leave them out. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Diego. Uh, Julie is, is painting this, uh, I would say, dynamic perspective, looking at how the policies has evolved in, in South Africa, uh, also taking into account the tension that might happen between uh, and across systems. Uh, Conocer has been there also for many years. What has evolved since uh, this establishment, and, and what are the tensions that you see in the context of, of Mexico, in the context of Conocer? Well, uh, if it work, okay. works. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Diego Piazza. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, everyone for your attention and uh, to say that it's a privilege for Conocer to be present in this uh, event. Please bear with me with my English if anything doesn't make sense or if I stutter a bit, uh, please. You can speak Irish. <laughs> uh, that might be a bit troublesome for me. Uh, so, uh, as Borain said, CONOCER has been working for over a quarter of a century in the certification of labor skills in Mexico. And uh, it, has, it has been a tough road. I would say that the biggest barrier we uh, constantly face in, in Mexico is still the, the stigma that comes with a certification of a skill, in contrast with the formal education system. There's still a uh, this view that is like uh, less important or that is not something as valid as a diploma or uh, a, a degree. So that's definitely, definitely a, a barrier. And also, and, and that is something that we have been uh, working particularly in this, in this administration, it has to do with uh, the concept of inclusion. And uh, we have, and, and I actually spoke with, with Ted in a video conference earlier, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We have, of course, our main mission is to improve the productivity and the competitiveness of people. But uh, we have to look at vulnerable groups. And for example, we have been uh, developing comp competency st standards for indigenous people about their crafts, about their uh, traditions, that sort of uh, knowledge. So the moment you um, develop a, a competency standard, you are help, helping them preserve that knowledge. So we, we feel that's important. So obviously, inclusion is, is, very, is very important. We're working uh, with migrants, too. We have a, a big migration prob problem in Mexico, but with people that are returning from the United States and we know that they uh, acquire important skills and knowledge while they were abroad. And it's very difficult for them to have uh, documentation or papers. And one key aspect of, of CONOCER is we really don't have a significant barrier of entry. If a person can demonstrate that they have the skill, that they are, the term we use is competent, that they are competent in one of our standards, they can just go uh, do a diagnostic and proceed to the, to, to the evaluation. So that is key in our model. So I would say those are some of the, the, the main barriers we are facing right now. Basically, the stigma. Also, of course, like a lot of government institutions, and, and I mentioned that on, on the call with, with Ted, with Nan, uh, we're, a, we're a small institution. So obviously, we have limited budget, limited resources, but we try to do the most with it. Well, thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Dejong Kang, uh, uh, Julie and, uh, and Diego um, uh, mentioned uh, the issues of uh, the recognition and the mobility, in particular Diego just mentioned mobility and mobility of, of people across uh, borders. But there is, uh, in our work, for example, at, at UNESCO in, in the future of education, we speak about mobility across times, across learning spaces, learning settings. Uh, how, what is the situation in, in Korea when it comes to recognition of prior learning in higher education and, and how uh, the mobility across those different settings and spaces uh, are valued and, and recognized, it? please? Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me to diversify uh, this VPR, the Conf BNR, uh, because I don't think many faces from Asian heritages in this room. 
uh, it's good to recognize by uh, the Western culture. Uh, thank you for inviting me and the opportunity to share the Korean experience in this uh, wonderful conference. I think mobility can be examined from at least uh, three dimensions. Uh, chapter seven of the Futures of Education report by the UNESCO, the term they used is the education across different times and space. Uh, if I can say that the, the concept of learning uh, is wider than the education, uh, we might ask uh, that how can we connect learnings across various times and space so that the learners can effectively utilize their different learning outcomes. So the first dimension, mobility concerns access. Uh, so the, in many of the uh, your practice is the accessing the higher education through the VPL or RPL, anything. In South Korea, uh, we have an opportunity to widen the access of the non-traditional adult learners to higher education now because of the very low fertility rate in South Korea. So the, the university, the traditional university are interested in attracting more non-traditional learners. So we have many policies implementation now. So it is a big sign. Uh, the second dimension I would like to uh, raise is the outcome of learning. What is in mobility? Uh, it's not just the learners, but the outcomes of learner, outcomes of learning. It is an operational aspect of the VPL. So the concrete nature of the VPL uh, is a credit hours or the passport. So in this context, I think the, the Korean practice uh, for the last 25 years, we opened a, a national system that called the academic credit bank system. So we have a central bank of the credit hours. So the credit is accumulated in from different times and space, not just from the formal university, but also the non-formal institutions in the field. So that uh, the learners can learn whatever they want and the national government uh, accumulate the outcome of those learning as a credit hours. So the learner can utilize those uh, credits in the bank uh, to complete their formal degrees, uh, conferred by the Minister of Education, and sometimes the universities can use this one. So the university president also confer the degree, the formal degree, uh, out of this credit bank accumulating you know, the credit hours. The third dimension, the last dimension, is the mobility related to the cross -board, crossing the borders. Uh, there are a growing number of cross-border learners. Uh, you know, the internationalization of the labor market and higher education. And also uh, the individual life context change caused by the, you know, the political instabilities, uh, like a North and South Korean relations, and also the, the Ukraine situation in Ireland, and also some of the environmental degradation uh, caused many, you know, the mobile uh, refugees in the, in the world. So those who has in, in supper uh, or sometimes political asylum, they seek to be recognized their prior learning in their hosting countries. So in South Korea, we have a North Korean refugees. So we try very hard to recognize the undocumented uh, learners from North Korea because they came to South Korea, nothing. So it's just, just their body. So we don't know their any background. So uh, we developed kind of a, a special system to recognize their learning in North Korea. So uh, maybe UNESCO's effort to, you know, the, the passport system, maybe that can be uh, enhanced the mobility of the learners across borders. So I think uh, also the, the internationalization of the higher education and our low fertility rate in South Korea, we try to attract more learners from outside, uh, especially from Asian countries and African countries, uh, those countries who had, uh, which has a, a higher fertility rate and you know, the more population so that the uh, people in those countries can move, uh, immigrate uh, into the South Korea. So how we recognize the international aspect of the prior learning is very important issues in, our, in South Korea. Uh, thank you. No, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Pauline, uh, thank you. Uh, Pauline, Pro Professor Ted mentioned earlier about the, the tension between emancipatory 
versus functional or instrumental approach of the recognition. And, and uh, Professor uh, Dai Jung Kong just, just referred also to the outcomes of the recognition. Uh, from your perspective, uh, is the recognition uh, should lead to uh, a qualification, or uh, does it also open for recognition of uh, citizenship, participation, other forms of recognition that are not necessarily uh, qualification-based and, and can lead to maybe more inclusive approach for um, economies and societies? What is, what is the perspective from uh, EU, please? Well, can you hear me? Yeah, that's a very long question. I should have noted down. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. This is my third Biennale, and I feel already very recognized to, to be on the stage uh, for this third uh, time. It's a very interesting uh, sensory experience, uh, not only because I'm on the stage, uh, but also I can smell the food, but we haven't uh, of lunch. <laughs> we haven't gone to coffee break yet. Um, anyway, so um, to, to answer your question, I, I will focus my intervention on the European context, as this is uh, mainly our policy and geographical uh, coverage in my organization, uh, but I believe that my comments can also be exported to the international or applied uh, there. So in my organization, the Lifelong Learning Platform, we are the European Civil Society for Education and Training covering lifelong learning. We are an NGO based in Brussels. We mainly see the added value of validation from the perspective uh, of its potential for inclusion in the way that it allows individuals who might not have higher education degrees, uh, diploma, certificate, uh, except from secondary school, to get recognition and value on the learning that they acquired in non-formal and informal learning environment. For instance, through the participation into sports, in leisure, um, in volunteering, in self-directed uh, learning, uh, in, the, in their engagement in the local communities, and also through uh, family work, for, for instance, taking care of children. And the inclusive aspects of uh, validation is, however, generally something that we know little about. We don't have the data. I mean, in most member states, there is no data collected on the inclusive aspect of validation, how many uh, disadvantaged groups are being uh, validated, and, and so on. Uh, at LLLP, a short name for our organization, we participated in EU project where we demonstrated the potential for inclusion of validation with the target groups, I mean disadvantaged target groups. So it, there is potential. The main EU policy for validation dates back from uh, 2012. It's the Council recommendation for the validation of non-formal and informal learning and it was evaluated in 2020. And what we know from this evaluation is uh, so far the outreach and the uptake uh, of uh, uh, validation in EU member states is still very low. Uh, not all countries even have a validation, a functional validation uh, system in place, and the access to disadvantaged groups face many barriers, and those are the ones who need it most. Not only they are not aware of the validation opportunities, but if they, even if they were, they lack, uh, they, have, they face many barriers for access. For instance, they lack uh, basic skills, digital literacy to use the computer to go for the test, and so on. And this really hampers their success in the process. And another issue, uh, for instance, is the adaptability of the assessment tools for these groups. You need to translate the language, you cannot use uh, if you think uh, of the, the green competence framework that was produced uh, by the EU institution, like system thinking, or, uh, what does it mean for a disadvantaged person, you know, of system thinking? You have to translate it into concrete words that are applicable to their life uh, context. And how to define a competence. And really what we heard in our work is that career counselors sometimes uh, struggle with this translation work. And then another question we can ask ourselves is whether, and I think that uh, answers your question, whether validation always needs to lead to a full qualification as it is defined in that council recommendation I mentioned, and, and does it have to only have a labor market purpose? What about its role for social inclusion? 
In fact, uh, the way that we understand validation uh, at the lifelong learning platform is in a broader sense. So it doesn't have to lead to qualification, it doesn't have to be a full process from identification of competence, documentation, uh, assessment, and certification. Why not having it just for identification of competence? Why not having it just for documentation? Why not having it as a formative process? This is what you can do. Uh, this is what and where you can learn, how you can improve those competencies. And finally, validation should not just be about employability and, and thank the organizer for uh, pointing that out with the title of this conference. It's about building people's self-esteem, confidence, and act as active citizens also. So why not, for instance, having validation for volunteering? And you can find that you can, in some EU countries that, for instance, students who go on volunteering can get credits for that and they get recognition. So it should be mainstream. So I will just close my intervention with five main recommendations from our organization on validation and inclusion. First, we need better data monitoring and collection and research on inclusion. We should also focus on transversal competencies for inclusion. Um, the third would be to better integrate validation and guidance policy and work more with NGOs who have access with disadvantaged groups to increase the, the outreach, the uptake of uh, validation. Um, the fourth is that ideally we would need lifelong learning strategies or national skill strategies, but lifelong is even better, even more holistic, uh, working with different uh, governments that integrates also not only just skills focus, but validation and guidance, lifelong and life-wide. And finally, um, we need, I think in the future or right now, we should start working on how to connect validation policies with micro-credentials, uh, because validation used to be, in some cases, a very long process. So to increase access, we can shorter it. Um, and, and link it to, to, to micro-credential. Uh, this would uh, improve the access for everyone to validation. Oh, thank you, Pauline. Uh, uh, Kulisa, uh, I'm, I'm known by getting out of the run of the show <laughs> and taking more the, the flow of the discussion. I think uh, from uh, the discussion uh, and starting from the keynote, uh, it's about challenging a bit the outcomes of the recognition and basically taking a more holistic perspective on the recognition from uh, the em emancipatory approach to democratic society. And, and the question uh, to you, Diego, because uh, uh, Conocer has been more focusing on uh, employability, but probably that's a, a question to you is how Conocer in, in this context, but probably uh, taking it to a more broader perspective, how the outcome of the recognition can be taken to a broader perspective for more participation uh, of uh, individuals in society in, uh, as a citizen, not only as a worker. Is that something that Conocer is, is engaged in? And what are the barriers for that? Oh, well, sir, that's certainly something that we are working in. And uh, for example, one of our most interesting projects right now is within the Pacific Alliance, which is uh, conformed by uh, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. So uh, one of the projects we have there is, well, for starters, the uh, recognition and homologation of uh, skills within the four countries. We, al we already done a pilot for the uh, recognition of certificates, and we're working on the homologation so that from the start, the competency standard, well, the, it has different names in the different countries, is the same. So that's uh, obviously one step. But uh, something that we're doing within the Pacific Alliance is we're working with a green, uh, with the green economy. So uh, we're developing this inventory of uh, skills and competencies that, ha that have to do with recycling, with um, energy saving, cleaner energies, uh, the environment. So that uh, goes beyond the scope of just uh, employability, like you were mentioning, and changing for uh, something that is uh, a priority to preserve the, the environment. So that's one example. We also have several, uh, we call them, I, I guess the, the, the right name would be soft skills. We have developed 
uh, standards that are about learning, about effective communication, um, about uh, reading, about uh, um, entrepreneurship. So not just, uh, for example, a construction worker or, or a very defined job function. We do have broader uh, competency standards. We're trying to take this uh, more broad, broader approach to, to the development of competency skills. Right. And how this broader perspective of the recognition take into account this different set of, uh, of skills from education for sustainable development to foundational learning to entrepreneurial? How, the, how you measure the impact of uh, uh, this recognition? Do you have a, a monitoring uh, framework for it? Not really, no. Not yet. Uh, in fact, the work with the Pacific Alliance is uh, still relatively new. So it's something that is still in progress. Uh, and I actually would like to thank uh, Eurosocial, which is a, a European Union program that has helped us with this uh, project. And it's still something that is in progress. Uh, regarding the other uh, uh, competency standards, we do not have a close monitoring that goes beyond our scope as an institution. And uh, one thing that is important, and, and it's actually in line with the, with the topic of democracy, is our standards are the result of a social dialogue, because they are uh, the result of government intervention, business sector, labor institutions, and, of course, uh, educational institutions. So it relies more of, on them to measure the the success of their, the, the standards they are developing, of the people they are uh, certifying, than on Conocer. So we don't really have the data. They do. The, we, we call them uh, competency manage, management committees, and they're formed by the leaders of the industries, with the workers, with the business leaders, and with the educational institutions. So they are the better judges of, how, of the impact they're having. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dirk. Pauline, uh, is it a, a similar approach? How, because you are you're almost complaining about the lack of data, but what is the proposal of the lifelong learning platform to ensure that there is a better monitoring of the recognition processes and uh, to take this more holistic approach? Do, do you have a proposal? Are you working on, on uh, in this area? Well, what usually works very well in the EU is peer learning. So we know that some countries are a bit um, pioneer and advanced in, in terms of collecting data. I mean, we always quote the uh, Nordic uh, countries, uh, of course. Uh, I think that they do uh, have some data and they can uh, not uh, yeah, share with other EU countries how they do it, what do they, what do they collect. Because what we see is uh, usually they collect the data on um, Okay, after a validation, how, much, how many people get a new job? How many people, okay, sometimes they, until they stay in the job, retention in the job. But um, what else do they collect? So I think just looking at what works in uh, some EU countries and what is being done, and then trying to share this with other EU countries would be a first step. And then secondly, the EU can always make recommendation on that and, and ensure that I mean, it's not just about validation. Overall, data in education is very much focused on um, the labor market and employability. I mean, there's the Education and Training Monitor, which is the main publication that is uh, every year being published at a European level, which is now being a bit more social in the way that it's uh, dispelled the data. Uh, but I mean, overall, we know that in higher education is the same. We always collect the data on grades or success, or academic success, but not so much on the, um, the well-being of the students. You know? So it's a general change that needs to happen, a paradigm change, I think, in terms of what kind of data actually matter and uh, finding ways to collect that. Thank you. Julie, can this work in the context of uh, South Africa, but the African context, this peer learning approach to uh, maybe make uh, shifts in the higher education system to recognize uh, learning happening in different settings and in different contexts and, and create that mobility across uh, learning spaces and, and learning modalities? Yeah, um, Boreen, I think the problem in our country is we almost held hostage to higher education, narrow academic practices. Uh, and I'm saying that because 
having been in the space for about 40 years, but um, there is a change in thinking. I work for a university that uh, is very enlightened and just appointed me as professor of practice to bring practice into the ac ac academy, which wasn't really there before. And it's the Center for Educational Rights and Transformation. And I think that's very important. The rights of the learner, putting learners at the center. Uh, and it is a good space to work in because it challenges our thinking. One of the things for me is we became very um, you know, skills driven and very functionally driven even in our RPL practices. So our objectives for our learning outcomes is to know, do, and understand, which is our qualifications are being written as job descriptions. They're very employment-centered, which is very troubling. I like the UNESCO additional two principles that really resonate with me. So they say to know and do, that's fine because you need a livelihood, but to live together and to be. Right. And I think those are absolutely crucial principles, even in our recognition practices. And I don't think we're embracing it enough. We pay lip service to these things. And the last thing I want to say, it is opening up our thinking, putting the learners at the center. But right now, I feel like we're drilling square pegs into round holes because we're trying to fit recognition of prior learning into formal academic practices. The written portfolios of evidence do not work with our refugee community. In my refugee project, I realized second, third language people don't work with that. People who are neurodiverse, which now IT companies are looking for, and if they suffer from neurodiversity, autism or dyslexia, dysgraphia, all of those, putting down portfo narrative portfolios of evidence is problematic. So I, I know somebody is speaking on this. I'm uh, saying that maybe we embra embrace a both and and bring in show and tell as a key assessment tool for RPL. Because while RPL is a very expansive way of thinking, of embracing non-formal and informal learning, it doesn't matter what your pathway is, our assessment practices and how we choose to recognize is still very traditional. And I think we fall short in that way. Oh, thank you. Uh, and Professor Dejong, you, you mentioned earlier some of the factors that uh, can drive also changes, the demographic one, as you, you yep. just uh, rightly pointed to, and, and the need to attract more students, basically. Mm -hmm. That uh, is a, a facilitator for uh, maybe more flexible uh, recognition. Uh, are there other factors that uh, you, you could uh, highlight? Just to, to mention, for example, in, in Korea, you have adopted uh, a, an entitlement to lifelong learning. Uh, is that something that can also drive maybe possibilities for recognition of prior learning or learning to, to follow what Professor Ted was, was mentioning. Is that a, are those are factors that can shift a bit the, uh, the, the, the situ, uh, the, can change the situation and can drive a, a maybe much more open recognition processes? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, the VPL or RPL in South Korea kind of a, a driving force to reshuffling education system itself, because uh, you mentioned the, the learning web uh, that we had from the 1970s. Uh, in South Korea, we have uh, a, a academic credit bank system recognizing non-formal and informal learning outcomes from various institutions in the outside of the formal education system. But also, we developing a new system on individual learning account uh, that we try to recognize the uh, learning outcome from the, our learning city project. So every individual government has their non-formal uh, provision of the different uh, learning opportunities for uh, ordinary citizens. So uh, once you uh, kind of take a course uh, from the community centers or various uh, public uh, educational institutes for the adult, 
uh, you can accumulate your learning outcome in, the, in your own individual learning account. So, and then uh, individual CT utilize those accumulated outcomes. Uh, sometimes they provide some monetary incentives so that they can use those monetary incentives in the, you know, the environment protection, you know, the, the eco-friendly shops so that we can enhance uh, learning outcomes with the different social aspect that we need to promote. And also uh, the individual learning account outcome also, uh, we try to push the government that you should recognize these learning outcomes uh, in the formal system, like a university when you uh, attract more non-traditional learners, uh, you should recognize those uh, outcomes accumulated in the individual learning account. So that not just the validation of the formal system, but also uh, individual learners can learn uh, anywhere, anytime, anything, uh, so that they can develop you know, the generic kind of uh, characters uh, that needed in the many different places, not just in the job market, but also uh, individual development. So uh, you should recognize that. Uh, so we try to develop an individual learning account more and try to put uh, real money to promote uh, the learning opportunities or learning access. So uh, maybe in the end, we may uh, kind of a, a, a shake the very rigid and very Demo, uh, you know, the very leaky the uh, current education system itself, so that the uh, it's, it's kind of a developing a new currency in education system. I think it's a, not not just a formal diploma or the degree; uh, it's the currency in the education, but uh, uh, some different kind of a metaphors in uh, out of the uh, learning account system we are developing now or the. Academic Credit Bank itself was, uh, is just uh, another example of the uh, educational currency in the system. So uh, in, in a way, we uh, are developing a kind of a, a platform for revolutionizing the, the current education system itself. So yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a last question to you, and uh, it's uh, more leveraging what uh, Professor Ted mentioned. Uh, in his conclusion, he uh, mentioned that recognition and democracy um, should assume each other. Uh, and that's, for me, part of the new social contract, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, in one word, uh, what would be the, the uh, most important policy measure that you would recommend if that's what we would like to achieve? What is the policy measure that you would recommend, Julie? One word, can I do two? Yes. <laughs> um, and I'd really recommend you talk to people in the room, is to open recognition, not close it, because right now it's closed. So. Thank you. <laughs> Diego? Uh, for me, it would be accessibility and inclusivity. Thank you. Professor Dojon? I think uh, open and clear uh, is the uh, widening, uh, is, the, is the best word we can use. Pauline? Um, I said it already, but lifelong and life-wide strategy, but not just focusing on adult learning, please. Lifelong. Bye. Thank you. Well, thanks to uh, our panelists, I would like to take uh, three uh, elements of, of our discussion. Uh, one, uh, I think, is, is very important to place uh, the discussion on the recognition within uh, the, the human right perspective and, and the right to lifelong learning in, in this broader um, and opening uh, using the term that, that uh, Julie mentioned. The second uh, seems to me uh, very important regarding the recognition locally, nationally, and uh, regionally, and, and globally. Uh, I think uh, for many years we have been thinking about recognition at a local or national level, but today the question is how we can recognize and value in across borders, how we can recognize uh, the, the value of people and, and their learning in different contexts, in different settings across the globe, and that's something that uh, seems to me an agenda for all of us. And the last um, is uh, 
There is no democracy without sustainable development. So if recognition uh, is assuming, or if recognition and democracy are assumed, I think recognition, democracy, and sustainable development are assumed. Thank you very much, and thanks to the panelists.